good morning everybody this is where I stayed last night <laughs> uh, it looks good <laughs> um, yeah it's a, it's a was going to camp and it started raining in, in the evening and uh, and I just thought look and it had been raining up here for a few days in a row and it did rain all last night so I'm glad I didn't um, ever I would have been all the camping gear would have been wet and um, I would have been miserable and maybe ha would have had trouble getting out of the mud that was down by the river where I'd sort of marked out a camp spot um, yeah but it's a bit of a problem if you if you're traveling and you're um, and you're uh, you're going to um, you're, you're, you're going to do last minute like if you're just going by the wing you know you're just saying okay wherever I land I f I'll, I'll find a place for the bigger places you're never going to have a problem for the bigger cities and a Bankay in Peru is it's quite a big city like you know a hundred thousand people or so uh, however that's not a big city um, and the choices on offer were bad bad and deplorable um, okay so a couple of hours outside of Cusco 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 oh it flew into me then big butterfly been really only been about 10-15 minutes of rain so far I'm sweeping all the way down and you can see the road as it goes down it's crazy Oh gosh, I'm a lucky fella. A lot of those little waterfalls, um, they actually let them cross the road and they've created a little trough in the road. You've got to be real careful going through those. Because <laughs> after a while they just, you know, develop moss and that underneath and they are as slippery as buggery. I go through them at okay speed but I just keep the bike nice and straight. I don't accelerate, don't brake in there. Uh, you can even just glide through under um, with a clutch held you know it gets a bit spooky especially when some of them are on a bit of an angle or on a corner you know you really I really slow down and the trucks just drop the road the trucks and cars just go fly through them but they are slippery I went one through one in uh, in uh, Colombia and um, it was really deep and the water was running really fast and I put my feet on the ground underneath it to uh, get a bit of grip and uh, to keep the balance of the bike and I, my, my feet wouldn't, they would just slip from under, it was just mossy. This is fun though. You'll, uh, you'll, you'll hear a noise when a truck's coming because they bip their horn but they cut the corner really, really massively. But they do toot so you can hear them but still I'd rather them just take the corner as a, as a professional driver and learn how to do it properly without having to take up half the road opposite you, you know. I mean, oh, we got a bit of stop here. Take a photo of that. So yeah, um, yeah. So a lot of the roads have that with those waterfalls. They just let them flow across the road, but they make it like a concrete trough through the road so it's a bit of a dip a bit of fun if it's dry a little bit of a feeling only in your gut as you go over it at speed so I don't know I, I didn't do as much research as I should have on this road uh, I asked a couple of guys ahead and they said oh it's fine you know um, again you just got to watch out for the buses and obviously that those road works they just chuck stand in there and then then the next crew comes through later and uh, cleans it up but they still leave it really uh, pretty rough 
But all in all, the uh, Peruvian government does commit a fair bit to their roads. And, I mean, they have to because they're, half of them have got just... So this is what happens afterwards. And then another crew comes through up after that. Um, but uh, they've got a lot of these faces that just get covered in rock and they have landslides all the time, mudslides. Roads get cut off. And as I left, um, when I left, uh, oh, I can't remember the name of the place now. They, um, the half the roads was washed out. There's sand all over it. Not much fun. I'd rather sand than clay than wet, wet clay though. Wet sand rather than wet clay. Every day of the week. At least I can get into the sand, you know. The clay you just slip over it. Especially with these tyres, these hide and owls. Um, their, their kryptonite is wet, slippery clay. But that's pretty much any tyres kryptonite. I wouldn't want to be on anything less than this. Uh, wouldn't want to be on a on a uh, my with, with the standard tyres that come with the 1290, the Continental Attack. I mean, you just I would have been off this bike 20, 30 times on this trip with those on. I mean, you can ride with them, but you just got to. I'd have to s s slow the speed half down in it. Not that I ride fast through that anyway. So uh, now I'm going in all the way down inside, down the bottom. It's amazing, I came from up there. I've made about 400 metres in the last 20 minutes. It's a fun ride. Someone get going straight across there, I imagine. Some of the, off, some of the roads I've been on, that you go off the main highway and they connect back again. Uh, so that the old roads, um, some of them, the amount of, uh, you know, crosses from deaths on the road, is, some of them are just incredible. You know, I'm thinking, how many people can die? You can't fit any more crosses on that corner. And that's because of the mentality of the way people drive here. They're the worst drivers in all of them, all of, uh, that I've ever encountered anywhere, anywhere. One, they don't have the skill to do what they do. And two, they just take unnecessary risks all the time. They'll go, they'll overtake around this corner, you know, thinking, oh, well, there's hardly any cars on the road. What are the chances? Chances are one in every thousand. That's what I always say. 999 times you get away with being a smart ass or a hero. Only one time and that's the end of your bike riding days and more than likely the end of your life. water running I think. Yep, right down. Oh that's pretty. Looking on the wrong side of the bridge there. Is that a church? Hi guys, so you were just listening to me as I was riding along. Again, this microphone thing just got a little bit crackly uh, and got a bit of the video to uh, to get moving on. Um, today's ride was like a three, four hour ride, a four, four five hour ride, uh, that's all. So I left really early in the morning um, and, uh, and made, I was making my way to Cusco, which is basically going to be my launch pad for getting into uh, Machu Picchu and the Sacred Valley um, <coughs> which I'll do some videos on both of those I Machu Picchu I rode my motorbike to the pickup point and then did the um, the train ride um, and I would uh, definitely um, the, the train ride on the Hiram Hiram Bingham which is a um, a a, uh, a, a like a, a five-star train and the reason was is that you've got a couple of choices with Machu Picchu and I'll talk about that in the other in a bit more in depth in the other in the other one but all your choices basically point to around about a cost of um, you know 300 
you know, two, three, four hundred dollars anyway. And I thought, well, I may as well do the full dice. I'm only going to be here once, maybe once in my whole life. So, um, so I ended up spending about seven to eight hundred dollars for the whole day. But it, and usually when you spend that sort of money, it's uh, it, it ends up being a bit of a waste. But it, it wasn't. It was sensational. The whole way they look after you from the start to the finish is quite incredible. You know, I had about six meals for the day because um, you leave really early in the morning and then you don't get back till like 11 o'clock at night. So it's a, it's a good 14, 15 hour day. That's a little bit risky. Uh, a good 14 hour day. These troughs here, <laughs> gotta be a little bit careful across those. A good 14, 15 hour day, yeah. So I was gonna use Cusco as, as, a, as a drop off point um, where I basically stayed there I got an Airbnb, which is a really good Airbnb. Internet was terrible, which was just the experience I was having everywhere. And it's nothing to be too bitchy about. Here I have a stop off, and I don't know if you can see the view from below, but I'll put some photos. So as you can see, let's take some photos here. Stupid face. There's some of the views from that point. It was, pretty, it was quite a sensational little stop point. And, uh, so my backpack, flip flops, great, great views. So yeah, um, so I was using that as a stop point. Um, a really, really cool sort of uh, ride, going across quite a few bridges along the way, through a few little towns. They were stopping car, some cars and trucks on that road. river was pretty full and flowing there. There's quite a few bridges, they're all, they look all exactly the same along the trip. But uh, you basically now follow the river along for, for, for quite some time. Good fun riding. Um, you know, a lot of switchbacks along the mountains and going, you go, you go down into the valleys and you go back up into the mountains again, then back down into the valleys and you just uh, repeat over and over again, which is, uh, it's pretty cool. And uh, this is basically what it's like also when you're going to Machu Picchu, where you follow the train, follows the, the valley all the way along the, alongside the pretty crazy raging river. So I had two, basically two, I mean, three things in Cusco. One was to explore Cusco, which is quite a historic little place. The other one was to go to Machu Picchu, and then, and then when I got once I got there, there's a place called Peru Moto Tours, and I wanted to go and speak to them and see if I could get someone, hire someone for a day, to go with me. On a uh, take take me off the beaten road and to some cool tracks and stuff like that, and so basically we're just going to drop in at Peru Moto Tours and talk to them there and see if I can hire a rider to be a guide for the day. I did that quite often on the trip in really cool places. And the main reason you do that is because you can you can get the lo local maps and that, but you're never really going to learn as much unless you get someone to take you. They'll talk about the history. These people are really well. You know, these guys normally go on big long tours, um, you know, two or three day tours, and so they're. They're pretty well versed in all the history. Um, and I had a, I mean, if this, you know, the cost of it's probably, depending on what country, anywhere from say $80 to $150 for the day, but well worth it. You get a, a guide for the day and usually a cool guy and, and then they know all the, they know all the little tracks you can go on and, and go on and off, and we went on some pretty cool tracks. It had been it had been raining a fair bit, so some of them were pretty slippery, and he decided not to go. See, there's those little little things on the road that can cause you lots of problems. Um, but uh, yeah, hiring a chill guide, I probably did it three or four times on the whole trip. Could have done it 20, 30 times easily, um, and it's worth the money every single time.
So we are going through one of the little little villages again. And getting closer and closer now to Cusco. I don't think I stopped in this town. Maybe maybe got some fuel now. Um, yeah, so I mean a, a good day's riding for me will probably about four hours and I'll need to fill up uh, fill up with fuel again four to five hours. Again, you just take the trucks on. They just, as you can see, they just park whichever way they want to do whatever they want the trucks. And Peru was probably, and I said it in the video before, was probably the worst drivers I've ever seen anywhere. Um, both cars, trucks, buses, obviously the the worst. And the reason why with the buses is because they, um, they're in, the, these are local buses. The big tour buses usually have two drivers, so. There, it's a lot safer. There's a bit of a check on each other, but the local buses, the ones going from city to city, they're um, off the off the walls crazy because um, they're all in. It's in a competition to get to the next bus stop first to get as many people, so they just take the most ridiculous risks you can ever imagine. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't, I, I'm pretty sure the Peru government they had another nightmare over Christmas with. Uh, 40 over the Christmas holiday period, like just for five days, 40 people, 40 deaths, about nine accidents or something in, involving buses. You know, with 40 deaths and buses, you're looking at probably maybe 120, 200 casualties, like people injured and stuff like that. It's just crazy. Um, unfortunately, you sort of get used to it and you're, you're always wary around a bus, whether you've got a bus behind you and you're just sort of doing a little bit of sightseeing and you know, riding at 80 k's an hour, then you just pull over and side and let the idiot go past you because they'll go right up your backside, you know. Um, so quite frustrating. So I was looking forward to uh, to Cusco and and uh, having having a little bit of a rest. Um, the plan was about four nights in Cusco um, and then to head on and head to towards Bolivia. Um, normally I'm not a huge, huge fan of, of uh, tourist, big tourist destinations, but this is one there you've got to experience. But the thing about it is it costs money no matter what. Just at the entry I think is about $150, $200 just to enter, enter Machu Picchu. Um, and there's a lot of people there um, and especially if you get a nice day there's lots and lots like the day that I got was rain cloudy sunshine it went you know all four seasons in one day and you know today even even approaching you know you go through one part part of the with all the mountain ranges you'd have little towns that were just drenched in bloody like a few minutes of rain and then that's it that whole town or that whole area would be just drenched in water and then five minutes later, you're on dry roads again. Um, so always, always interesting. Um, lots of switchbacks. They're always so you can see there where they've had a landslide and they're having having to clear it all up. And that just comes from uh, the the rain, uh, the amount of rain they get. So they get like massive downpours of rain. You just safely take the trucks on whenever you feel it's appropriate. A lot of the times you can see all the way across too, you can see across the roads what's coming. Just got to be a little bit careful that you know what's in front of the truck or car that you're, or bus that you're, you're passing. That there's, if, make sure there's not another vehicle. But it's just great fun riding. I mean, Peru was just you know, there, there was there's only a few, a couple of days of straits that were a little bit boring, and the rest of it going up into the Andes and uh, into the ranges were just sensational. And I, I didn't have too many bad days. I had a couple of a couple of uh, ascents up high mountains where the, you were covered in, in clouds and and mist and rain and a little bit miserable and pretty cold.
know, it's just about, you know, before you take a ride each day, you know, I mean, normally I'll get off on the, ru- on, on the, on the road and uh, just the first, after the first 15, 20 minutes, um, you know, uh, just ease off and just check everything on the bike. Before I ride every day, I do a little, a little check over a whole bunch of things. There's another little town, I'll just, uh, just uh, I can just ride wherever I want. <laughs> you, there's no tolls for bikes, which is a good idea. You know, because most of the locals get around by motorbike. So, you know, even if they're, you know, that you'll see people packed on, you know, three, three people, four people packed on one motorbike, even a little, a little Vespa type, you know, those little um, scooter type bikes. Uh, but that's how most people get around. Um, so the tolls are really uh, for the trucks and that, but they still get everybody else. Yeah, lots of, all, you always get a lot of animals on the road as well. There's just one passing through one town where it just pissed down with rain. And then it was fine again just a little bit later on. Okay, coming, into coming into Costco now. Costco. 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 Why did I say Costco? Jeez. Uh, Pretty uh, impressive town from above. I wonder what it's like. At that level, the, ro- the roads as per normal are horrible coming in. Potholes and. I've made good time though, about 15 minutes earlier I might have a scoot around the historic area. Apparently the place I'm staying at is not that easy to find, a few people make comments. Doesn't look like it's any use to try and overtake anyone, there's just cars all the way down. <laughs> but I was lucky, I only had a couple of little showers. It wasn't that cold, I, I put the I put my uh, waterproof gloves on. Um, and they're not really waterproof anyway. They're water resistant is probably a better term to use. I had one day where I wore them where I got drenched and they still got water in them so I'm going to hopefully try and find some real waterproof gloves because I don't want to be riding I mean these were a hundred and something dollars too Uh, I don't want to be riding um, in Bolivia, Chile and Patagonia um, with because one thing I don't mind uh, I mean, this is a main road into a city, like, seriously. <laughs> um, I don't want to be, I don't, I don't care about getting, uh, uh, it being cold, but I don't want to be wet when, it, when I'm cold. And that, that's a recipe for disaster on so many fronts. Looks like they're just sort of all these places that get when it when they have massive rains and they they get landslides they they're shoring them up. Oh, I can't turn left yet, sweetheart. There's no left turn. Couldn't possibly be meaning this road here. Oh well. We are. We're going to go down here. Sorry for my lack of skill there.
Get the fucking way, you idiot. Come over my side of the road and then hit, hoot me, toot me. So as you can see, there's no tourists around because tourists only go to the touristy areas. You get some adventurers that stay up in these sort of spots. One thing you notice here, here in Peru is 70, 80, 90, no matter, you're working. I see women carrying huge loads on their back, it will be 70, 80, even older. I don't think so. Navigate your way through the holes in the road. See. One or the other, mate. Are you, what are you doing? He's a cop too. <laughs> And it looks like I'm going to get some rain on my arrival, which, which won't be fun. Now I'm going to... How the freaking... I don't even think I can turn left. Yes, I can. I'm not going up there, am I? Looks like I am. One way. So now I've, uh, <clears throat> I've entered Cusco proper and I'm actually trying to find the road and there's just so many one-way streets that are, you know, I know where I've got to get to, but getting there is another thing. And what happened was I ended up going um, right up to where the Google Maps said the, the house location was and then tried to contact the owner. The owner wasn't there. Uh, I was going to be met by another person. Um, but the owner then told me, oh, the Google Maps is wrong. And I made my way up these cobblestone streets and these streets have, they've got the cobblestone, but then through the middle, they've got this gutter. 
So basically, if you, you, you can't sit in the gutter, you've got to sit on one side of the road. And, uh, and some of them are just one lane, really thin lane. And then there's cars, it's their two way streets. And it just, with, with a motorbike and with the cobblestone when they're wet, and it's, you know, we had a couple of showers while I was looking for my uh, thing and the bike would just slip. It was crazy. And, and you'd be going up ridiculously steep uh, uh, in, uh, inclines, you know. And so I ended up getting all the way up to the top, parked my bike, messaged the owner of the Airbnb saying that I'm here. And she's saying the person who's meeting you is right out front, of, and I and I couldn't go any further. So there was like four steps, so I couldn't go any further with my bike, and I was just um, a little bit tired, even though it's only a five-hour ride day. And then um, and then she said, and I sent her my location on WhatsApp. She said, "Oh no, no, you're in the wrong spot." And then she sent me the location I had to get to, and it was, and then I had to work out how to get to that location, which took about another thirty minutes because everything was one way. And then um, eventually, the uh, I, I was to meet the guy in the in the a little square right nearby where the house the, the property was, and then he basically walked me back to, uh, to took me to where I had to go. So I just followed him, and so I got there. That wasn't that wasn't much of an issue uh, in the end. Uh, but but uh, yeah, and I stood, I had to pay twenty dollars to store my bike for four days next door in a local garage and uh, that was fine and uh, the place is really spectacular views from from up top where I stayed but um, it was pretty dark where it, it was downstairs underneath but it was a nice little apartment um, however the Wi-Fi was terrible and you know uh, really poor connection they had all these wires going everywhere into it and connected into another room I really don't I mean if you've got a decent Wi-Fi connection the one thing you have to do is get Google Wi-Fi, um, and just if you're if you've got an Airbnb, get Google Wi-Fi, and um, especially if you've got a or even even a hostel, having Google Wi-Fi, you have your main connection, which you get a good connection, and then you put these little little wife Google Wi-Fi nodes around the place, and you'll have good Wi-Fi all throughout the place. For four or five hundred dollars, you can have you know a decent sized place could be well covered by their internet. I just don't understand why they don't, these people aren't on top of it that own all these places, you know. It, it, is, it is quite frustrating, especially when, like, I always make sure when I do a booking that if it's a hotel, I mention in my notes to them that you've said that this is, you've got uh, high-speed internet and I, and I need it for work. So then there's always a get-out. I can always say to Expedia, hey, this is what I asked for. This is what they promoted. They don't have it. I want a refund. I'm, I'm going to go to another hotel. Um, and the same with Airbnb, because uh, Airbnb will, will protect you every time. Um, if you, uh, if 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 the if the status is that we've got good internet, and on Airbnb it just says Wi-Fi, a uh, wireless internet. So you write a note to say, look, I'm looking at booking a property. Do you have good internet? Uh, is the internet good, strong, you know? And good internet isn't. I mean, good internet on this trip was five megabytes a second download, which is really basic internet. Um, the high speed is anything from 25 megabytes a second up download speed and five to 10 megabytes upload speed. So yeah, I had all these issues all along, but I protected myself and two or three times on the trip, I ended up leaving the place and getting a full refund and going to another place. Uh, one guy just lied about everything, you know, um, and uh, hopefully he's been kicked off uh, Airbnb because he tried to screw me uh, over, you know, and he said, he told me to get a refund from, from Airbnb and then pay him cash directly. And then, and then he tried to um, extort money out of me. Um, I, I said, I'm not gonna pay the cash. I wanna check to make sure the, the room's right first. Um, sort of put me in a bit of a bind and uh, I, I contacted Airbnb and they said, okay, you can leave there. And then I ended up going to another town but the Airbnb was nice. The guy who, the guy who was the uh, who was the father of the girl who owned the property was a fantastic guy, really interesting guy. He used to work for the UN, um, and uh, he, you know I really enjoyed uh, chatting with him. A really really nice guy. But again, the Wi-Fi was terrible, 
And it doesn't mean that you, you're mean to somebody about the place, you just got to explain to them that you know, it's important for you to be able to have decent Wi-Fi. Uh, so most places you stay, you're out. This, this is where I had to park the first time. So that was the road I had to go up to get there. And this is the view from where the top of the apartment is, which is pretty cool. Um, and there's some of the steps up to the apartment. There's a nice part. This, this guy here came along and just started polishing my shoes. And I told him three dollar. He goes, well, three dollar, no, no. And he kept polishing. And I said, I'm not paying more than three dollars. I don't need my shoes polished. But if you're going to do them, and he wanted fifteen dollars, and he did one shoe and then just left, because I said I'm not paying any more than three dollars. And then he left thinking I'm going to say, okay, come back, let's do five. And I said, no. You know, you just came up to me. That's the sort of food you get. Uh, that's the centre square in Cusco. Pretty cool, cool area. The only thing that really annoys me about these centre squares is. These historic centres, they have freaking McDonald's and fast food restaurants in them. Just stick to his, historical uh, travel places, um, local businesses. It, if you make a law in these historic places to have those things, then you don't get all this ridiculous stuff there that just takes away from the, the aura of the place. McDonald's, KFC, all that crap. Jeez, you know. Um, but I bought some... If you're going to buy stuff from those squares of Peru, they treat their indigenous people really badly. So make sure you get buy something from them if it's a little souvenir or something. All right, guys, questions or comments below.